done. Right now we have Arndt Bergman talking to us on virtualization. I'm just happy for you to ask questions throughout the presentation, and if you would like to, please remember to raise your hand so I can give you the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm working on networking in KVM. Much of what I'm saying today will be for other hypervisors as well, or even across hypervisors. My talk will focus on three main areas. So most of you might be thinking, well, we have virtualization working fine today. Networking just works, so what's wrong with it? So, mm, window. Yep. Ah, right. So the three areas that I want to talk to you about that are possible to improve, still where we, some of these areas we need to do a lot, are features. So we want to have virtualized networks do all the things you can do currently with a real network and possibly more. Like there's a lot of things where you can take advantage of the fact that you're running a virtual machine, but it also should do everything that you're doing already. The other part is performance. Obviously, you want to get it, as, get it to run as fast as possible. If you have a virtual machine running, ideally it should run at the same speed as the machine that's hosting it. It should be able to use the 10 gigabit network card that you pay a lot of money for. And in some cases, you might even want it to go faster. Like if you're transferring data from one virtual machine to another, you don't have any overhead of the hardware. So ideally, you want to go much faster in that case. And thirdly, we have the management aspect. So network management is a huge market, and there are a lot of companies making money off of that. You want the network management folks in your company to, to be able to do all the things they can currently do on their hardware-based switching and routing infrastructure, and ideally even more than that. So let's look at what virtualization does today. If you have some virtualization software running on your laptop, chances are it looks something like this in a virtual machine. This is uh, the most common kind of uh, Wi-Fi router. Um, basically, it lets you connect multiple machines to an outside network, to the Internet. Each of those machines can act as if it was connected to the outside world um, directly, but you can't easily connect from the outside to this machine. This is what we call network address tr translation. And this is what you do in Linux to set it up. So if that's all you want, you're totally fine, you're in the wrong talk, because that already works, and there's nothing more we really need to do to improve that experience. But the company I work for wants to make money off of data center people who are running a lot of services on virtual machines, and for this, it obviously doesn't work, because you can't make connections to the inside without going through a lot of work setting that up. Um, the next best thing is something like this, router. So you just um, add a virtual machine, just like before. You add some static route to it, and the IP stack of the hypervisor, which in case of KVM is Linux, and other hypervisors do this similarly. You wouldn't use this command line on, on some other hypervisors, but it's, it's essentially the same idea, and people have been doing this for ages. So um, the hypervisor knows about TCP IP networking, the guest gets assigned an IP address, and it can communicate to the outside, inside out, and um, that's all fine. Uh, but still, there's some limitations, like you can't do dynamic IP address management with VHCP with this, at least not easily. You can't run stuff like fiber channel over Ethernet over this, and a lot of other protocols that people might want to run besides IP version 4. Oh, so you really want something like this, a really big switch where all the computers get into. Um, and the virtual machines can communicate over this big switch just like they're doing over big data center switch today. And we do that in KVM. 
most other hypervisors today do that as well because this is really the right solution. And um, so basically what we do here, we have a bridge inside of the hypervisor and this extends your Ethernet segment into a number of virtual machines. One thing that this allows us to do that you can't do with the previous approaches is migration. We can actually move a virtual machine from one hypervisor to another hypervisor running on a different machine. And that's a great feature of virtualization. That's one of the reasons why people want to use virtualization in the first place. So what do we need to, to get that really running? One thing that we need is um, having unique MAC addresses. So every MAC address in the, uh, in the migration domain needs to be different from all the other MAC addresses because if they're the same, uh, things start breaking. So normally, MAC addresses get assigned by the person that uh, sells you the hardware. So each Ethernet NIC has its own MAC address that's globally unique. If you have virtual machines, usually what we do is the hypervisor calls the function to generate a random MAC address. And since it's random, it might not be unique. It almost always is, but in theory, that's a, there's a small hole. So some, one thing that we do in, in hypervisors, and we're just about to add that to KVM, is managing uh, sub-partitioning of the MAC address space that we're using for virtual machines. So we have a fixed prefix that we assign to a hypervisor, or a group of hypervisors in which we want to do migration. And then the hypervisor takes care of managing MAC addresses within that space. Um, yeah, this is a really bad picture. This is actually the port of Wellington, and it's uh, showing port profiles. So what we've come up with in a group, a subgroup of the IEEE group that specifies Ethernet is the concept of, of port profiles. We define a port profile on the switch, which can be a virtual switch, or which can be an actual hardware switch. We'll come to that in, in a bit. But in both cases, we have a port profile specifying any sorts of access control rights. Um, you can limit what kind of protocols a guest can, can uh, use. You can limit what MAC addresses you can claim to, to have and all sorts of things. You can do bandwidth limitation. But we define it in a way that is not just local to this one hypervisor or one switch, but that is global in the, in the data center. So if the data center has uh, a port profile for a web server and another port profile for a test box, then you just set, set up this profile once, and then you assign a new virtual machine to one of these, pro these profiles. And if you move the virtual machine, you say, well, I've got a new port here, and please put that po uh, the port is already bound to the, to the web server profile, so when moving this, use the web server profile on this other switch as well. So that's, that's all for the, for the features for now. So migration is the most important feature that we get by um, using virtualization. And we still need to do some need to, to do some work to get this actually running everywhere, but the basics are done there. So let's look at, let's take a look at the uh, performance aspects. So let me first describe to you very briefly what the networking stack in KVM looks like. And the other networking stacks are not that much different. First of all, we have a driver um, that drives the guest network card. The guest network card um, is an emulated NIC, and the operating system running in the guest needs a driver for that. Then we have QMU. The other half of that, we have a tab in the, in the hypervisor, basically uh, connecting QMU to the host kernel. 
in the host kernel, we have a bridge and finally another driver that's driving the real hardware, as you can see. And on top of that, we have the NIC. <laughs> For those of you who are not from, from New Zealand, NIC is a member of the parliament and is apparently well known to most people here. I didn't know him before. Um, ideally, what we want to replace all this with is exactly this, nothing. The, the less we have from this stack, the better, because anything, any, each part of that adds a specific amount of overhead. So um, ideally, the guest would just do magic and talk to the wire and be done with it. And we can get pretty close to that if we do device assignment. That is, there are multiple words for this. Intel calls this SRI, SRIOV or VTD. In IBM calls this um, HEA or um, yeah, some other things. It's basically all the same. The idea is that you give a guest control over actual hardware. You let it poke the registers of a card, or you let it um, do hyper calls to interact with that card directly. And it doesn't get much faster than this. So you cut the hypervisor out of the picture. Most of what the hypervisor does is completely bypassed, and the guest directly talks to some hardware the switch actually becomes part of the hardware. So cards doing this will typically have the equivalent of the Linux bridge code running on the, on the NIC itself. And when one guest talks to another guest, it sends out the frame to what it thinks is the real network card. And that network card just turns that frame around, sends it to the other guest on the incoming path. Um, which is nice from a CPU load perspective, and it may or may not add some latency to, your, to, to the path between virtual machines. The biggest disadvantages of device assignment are, first of all, you need to have an IMMU supporting this. And if you have an IMMU, most hypervisors actually require you to pin all the memory of the guest into main memory. And that means uh, you cannot give the, the sum of all guests more memory than you have s sitting in your system. And that's a serious limitation because one common scenario for why you want to run virtual machines is to save memory. You want to buy less memory than what these machine, what sh the, the total of what each machine uses at peak time. And you want to have some ways of paging out parts of a guest when they don't need all their memory. And another limitation is that this pretty much prevents you from doing migration, which is one of the great features that we want to gain in the first place. The reason for this is that the guest knows about the state of the hardware. The hardware knows partly about the state of the guest, and you can't migrate them separately. So you have to do an awful lot of work to really migrate a guest with the state of the physical hardware together. Um, so that's no good. So we should probably look at what other ways we can do to slim out the, the whole stack. First part, we've seen it before, this is the guest driver. Typically what we do is we emulate something like an Intel E1000 card or some other NIC that the company used to build before. And the guest just uses its, its native driver for that and we emulate it in QMU. Now, a nice way to get around that part is by using the Word.io net driver, um, written in large parts by Rusty Russell. So thanks, Rusty, for that. Um, this saves already quite a lot of the overhead in the guest. And we can, we can go further than that. So for the QMU part, um, there's a patch doing the equivalent uh, moving all the, no, it's not actually not the equivalent. It's moving parts around. Instead of emulating the Word.io net device in the, in the QME user space, there's a driver called vhostnet that just puts this into the kernel. That by itself doesn't gain so much because we're still doing the same work. We just save a few copies and intercepts going from user space to kernel and back in. Um, but it enables us to do a number of optimizations on top of that. 
Um, then there's one part that I'm working on personally, which is the bridge code. So if we want to have a lot of features that are present in the bridge, the chances are high that we actually need it. But um, many folks don't use all the sophisticated features that the bridge code has. For example, the bridge in Linux knows um, about all the MAC addresses present and all the interfaces. While in case of KVM, we already know what specific MAC address is used by the guest, so the bridge doesn't have to do learning. There's also stuff like spanning tree protocol, which is fairly complicated and it's a major part of the implementation of the bridge code just to deal with talking to other bridges and telling them where things are and how things uh, should get routed between the bridges. Um, we also don't need that. So a very simple way of doing this is to throw most of the, that code away and use something, uh, a driver called MacVLAN. How many of you have heard of MacVLAN before? Yeah, a few. I expected to see these. Uh, and actually, I was working for half a year on this project before I first heard of MacVLAN when, some, when uh, one of my colleagues just asked me, hey, what, what does this thing do? And I started looking at this and thought, well, that's almost what we need. So MacVLAN um, works in similar ways to the VLAN implementation in Linux. So it separates traffic from a, from a physical device by some property and makes a lot of virtual devices. In VLAN, they are split by VLAN ID from 802.1Q. In case of Mac VLAN, we just separate them by the, by the Mac address of the destination. And then we get a lot of what the uh, bridge code needs to do for the virtual machines but nothing of what the bridge code does not need to do. And most importantly, we get a direct connection of the physical interface to some property that's directly connected to a guest. And one driver that I really need to submit now, I wanted to get it into the previous kernel version and I didn't make it there and still fixing some bugs, but I really want to get it into the next version, is a tab interface for Mac VLAN directly so that we don't need to connect two separate modules in the kernel passing uh, frames over a socket, but instead we just have one very small module that talks to QMU directly and talks to the hardware directly. And that, cuts, that hopefully cuts out a lot of the overhead. Um, then there are other things that we can do to make networking go faster in virtual environments. So if you want to saturate a 10 gigabit network connection, one thing you really want to have is multi-queue support. If you can imagine people, all these people standing in one queue, it would take each of them a lot, time, a lot longer to finally get to whatever they're queuing up for. Looks like a supermarket checkout. So um, by having multiple queues, you can speed it up. Very simple. And Actually, implementing that obviously is harder because we need to, to get those multiple queues down from the NIC down to the, uh, to the virtual, um, virtual machine, basically to the applications running in the virtual machine. And ideally, we want to have that lockless, so traversing from an application through the guest driver, through um, QMU, through make VLAN or the bridge code until the, until the hardware driver. All of that should be multi-threaded so that uh, we can, the, the different processes running on the virtual machine don't interact with each other at all when, they're, when they all want to access the network hardware. And um, the other part that we want is zero copy. So zero copy is a funny term because zero copy never means that you don't copy at all. It just means copy one time less than we used to do. Right now we copy every frame at least twice when a guest application wants to send out something to the network. 
we copy it to the guest kernel, and the guest kernel is equivalent to the host user space in case of KVM. So we copy it again from the guest user uh, from the host user space to the host kernel, and then from there, obviously, we copy it over the PCI bus to the actual network hardware, and we want to cut out at least one of these copies, and we call that zero copy. For transmit, this is still fairly straightforward. What we do is we, instead of copying from the host user space to the host kernel, we take the socket buffers in the kernel and let them point to the uh, pages of the host user space, which are the guest kernel, which has already copied them into it. Or it could actually be doing some, some optimization itself so it did not have to copy actual user space pages from, from the guest user space. That's still not done, but it should be fairly simple to do. The harder part is doing zero copy receives. There's a question. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to make certain that in this process you're keeping in mind that uh, um, virtual machines aren't always owned by the people running the machine, so there needs to be some security in the area of uh, IP addresses and those sorts of things. Right. So yeah, that goes back to, to the earlier parts with the features where we... Uh, or do you mean the, during the zero copy in particular or in general? Okay, so in general, uh, that's really the job of the of the bridge code that needs to take care of this. So, uh, bridge or tab. Well, we, we're already taking care of that right now in the in the current stack. But there's, it's an important point with the, especially with the zero copy, um, because on zero copy receives, the network card uh, needs to find a way to decide where to copy the page, and there's a small difference between trying to copy it into the uh, into the ideal page most of the time for performance reasons, or never copying it into a, a wrong guest for security reasons. Because by definition, a guest must not be able to see the network traffic that's only meant for another guest. Or at least that's what we're trying to do. So. This will only work if you have hardware that's really optimized, well, that's, that ha has the capability to separate traffic between virtual machines. And that's something that's called VMDQ in some of the modern network hardware. So basically, the network card itself um, is made up of logical network cards. You can create more of these as you go up to a certain limit. And the hardware makes sure that these are separate. Coming to the third aspect of my talk, the management. So those of you who are working in a larger organization will know someone like Mordek, the preventer of information services. He's the one who's responsible for maintaining network security and for keeping the network running. And it, it would be very wise not to mess with him because he has the power to take off, uh, to, to do anything to keep you from working. You also don't, want, don't really want to have him poke on your machines. You don't want to give him a root account on your machine. So if you're running virtual machines on a hypervisor and you're responsible for running that hypervisor, um, chances are quite high that there's another guy who's responsible for managing the network and that's not you. So if we have the switch in the hypervisor being managed by Linux tools, then you need the root account on the, on the Linux machine just to do any settings there, or even just to look at traffic statistics. And that's something that Modek wants to do. And he's getting paid for that. So uh, it's not just like he tries to be mean. He's, get, he's being paid to be mean. Um, and one solution for this is called VEPA, the Virtual Ethernet Port Aggregator. Instead of having the bridge code in running inside of the hypervisor as we currently do, what we do is every frame that any guest sends out to the network 
um, to, to any guest gets sent out to the external NIC first. So here you can see the virtual machine one sending out one frame to anywhere else so it goes to the external switch. That part is like before. Now if you have the VM5 trying to send a frame to VM3, normally you would have a switch here that goes directly through the hypervisor or through the NIC in case of something like SRIOV. If we have VEPA, it gets sent out through the external wire, your gigabit Ethernet interface, to an external switch, and that switch decides, well, actually, the target, the destination MAC address of this frame is this one, so I'll send it back down the same wire. And that's something that switches generally don't do, and it's even not allowed in the specification 802.1D that tells you how switches are supposed to work. So there's an extension to the switch standard or to the VLAN standard um, IEEE 802.1QBG that uh, a group is currently working on in IEEE and I'm, yep, question. Uh, wait for the microphone. You mentioned that you're putting uh, the, VLAN, the VMware on different VLANs. Um, how are they communicating? They need uh, some kind of uh, in the VLAN routing, right? Um, so if they're on different VLANs, they, by definition, don't communicate directly. This is not talking about VLANs at all. It's just part of the, of the same, gener same general standard. But this is not using VLANs. If you have um, one VLAN for VM1 and another VLAN for VM3, uh, then they will not uh, talk directly here. They will also not talk through the external switch because the switch um, manages the, the, the separation between VLANs. Unless you configure the switch to, to do some IP routing between the VLANs, for example. Yes, and that, that's the layer three routing. That, uh, <coughs> that's the uh, multi-layer switch. Is that, is that what you're talking about? To do uh, a layer three routing on a, on a layer two switch? Yeah, that's, um, that, that's one way to connect virtual to connect uh, VLANs, and I'm not that much of an expert of how VLANs are managed, but in general, if you want to have hosts on separate VLANs, then, you, th then the intention is to have them not communicating with each other or have them communicate in a very controlled way, for example, by IP routing. There was another question somewhere. Oh, um, but there's another problem with this because um, you might want to have a more sophisticated setup. For example, you might want to have some of these guests be bridged directly. You want to, want to run the, the bridge code inside of Linux between some machines, and you still want to run this port aggregator between other machines. Or you might want to have machines that don't communicate with another at all. And that's where the multi-channel aggregator comes. So the multi-channel aggregator is an extension to that again. And even VEPA is not standardized yet. The multi-channel stuff is even further out. Uh, the implementation is something very close to VLANs. So we tag every frame going out on, from the hypervisor with some information um, that tells the switch which channel something goes through. This is one big wire, and we have logical channels on here. And each of uh, those channels has a separate tag. It could be a, a VLAN tag, and we can combine this with VLANs. So we can have multiple tags in front of the actual frame, and then these could be in separate VLANs, but still on the same port aggregator, but they are in the same channel communicating down here. Yeah, question. Having to have so much complexity within the hypervisor, how does it affect migration and needing to hold state of all of this um, complex stuff across multiple hypervisors in case you want to migrate one of the VMs? Yeah, good question. So um, this is all part of the pod profiles. I talked about the pod profiles earlier, and the pro pod profiles are actually um, developed in 
closely together with this stuff. So the port profile definition will contain information about how this is set up specifically. And then when you come to another machine, it will be set up in the same way. So actually, if you, but there's another good aspect that now that you mentioned this. Um, if you have a VEPA, then the port profile will be part of the external switch. If you, have, if you don't have a VEPA but have a virtual bridge right here, then the port profile will be stored in here. And that's a very important distinction. Um, if you have something like this, I don't actually know how it's supposed to, to be specified. It's probably we treat one port that's on its own channel, we will treat that very much like, a, like the VEPA here. Um, now, there are other solutions for solving the management problem. One thing that uh, has been developed for quite a while is an open source project called Viata. There's also a company, Viata, behind that project, but, it, but the, the, most of the stuff they have, or I think even all of the stuff they have, is completely open source. You can download it from here. Um, they started out as a project replacing expensive proprietary router boxes with a Linux, standard Linux PC box and network cards running standard open source software to do exactly the same thing that the expensive uh, proprietary stuff does. Now they've now went on um, and uh, moved the same code into a virtual machine. So you have your router or, net or switch um, management code running in a virtual machine, managing the hypervisor that it's running under. So in this case, Mordek can just log into that virtual machine and does not, Mordek will not be able to, to mess with the system setup, but he will be able to mess with the network setup in all the ways he likes to do it. So that's pretty cool. Um, another project that's a lot further out is something called Open vSwitch. So their vision is basically replacing all the switching infrastructure in your data center with their code. It will, um, it's based on a protocol called OpenFlow, and that can be made to run on switch boxes you already have from, I don't know, Juniper or Cisco or whatever. And it can also run on hypervisors. And then all these um, switches act together just like one big switch with a single unified management interface so that you only have to go to one place to manage all this. And it doesn't matter what kind of hypervisor you're running. They've ported this to the important open source hypervisors. And if any company that's producing a proprietary hypervisor is interested in it, they can also port it to them, to, to that hypervisor. So that's, that's it for the management stuff. There's the, the URL if you want to take a look at this. Um, the stuff is not merged into the mainline kernel right now. Part of the reason for that is that they're actually replacing all the code that we're currently using, which is not a, not a really good idea. But um, the vision where they're going sounds very interesting, so uh, keep looking at this. Um, so to summarize this, we have the three most aspects, three most important aspects. We have the features, we have performance, and we have management. And unfortunately, right now it's choose one of them. If you want to have the features, um, you basically run the stuff that you have right now. If you want performance out of the system, you have to do device assignment, but then you lose all the features and the management aspects actually get worse. And if you want to be able to manage it, um, you run something like a VEPA, and that means um, the performance will suck because every frame always has to get out of the, of, of the external interface and get back in, which really adds a lot of latency communicating from one guest to another. And you also don't get all the features that we currently have. So we're working on that. I hope that by next year we'll be to the state where we can choose two of these. Um, and maybe in two years' time, we'll have it all running perfectly. Um, I've put the speaker notes up on the wiki page here. 
if anyone's interested in reading up on this, the slides will be distributed. So are there any more questions? Hmm. No questions at all? <laughs> Was that too fast? Yeah, well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, here is a gift for contributing to our conference. Thank you. Um, let's have a round of applause for Arms.